My name is Alec Egi and I am a brewing instructor and program coordinator at KPU Brewing Program. Tonight I will be talking about the malting and brewing process, but mostly from the sensory perspectives. Sensory is important because beer is actually a food product, so when people make a decision on what kind of beer they want to buy or what kind of beer they like, that decision is mostly made based on the sensory characteristics of the product, so taste, smell, uh, flavor and aroma. I would like people to learn a little bit more about the entire process of malting and brewing, uh, but also how these raw materials taste before they're actually added to the brewing process and how that flavor is changed and, uh, and matured. Hi, welcome. It's so great to see so many folks on a Tuesday in June. Can you feel summer coming? Yeah, I'm loving it. Uh, my name is Pauline Finn, and I am the Vice President of Community Engagement here at Science World. And I think most of you are probably aware that Science World is a mission-based organization. Not if you agree or you heard that before. Maybe not. So right next to my heart here, I have my little cheat sheet. We carry our mission next to us. We're a charity and a not-for-profit. I'm going to read it just to make sure I get it perfectly. Our mission is to engage British Columbians in science and inspire future science and technology leadership throughout the province. Well, British Columbia is big and science is a pretty vast topic. So to achieve that mission, we have lots of creative and wonderful partnerships. And KPU is one example that we sort of hold up on a pedestal as an example and um, learning with KPU how to work together, bring your strengths, and provide something interesting to the public. Experiential learning is really important for us here at Science World, and tonight you're going to get it. Not only are you going to get to hear about barley to beer, but you're going to get to do some tasting. So without much further ado, I'm going to introduce your dean, the dean of, of science and horticulture, Betty Warabek. Thanks, Betty. Hello and welcome here. Um, I'm representing KPU, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, but I also like to put out a special thanks to Science World for their support and collaboration on what we call the KPU Science World Speaker Series Project. After a very successful first year of engaging and entertaining the public, as you, we're excited to be launching our next series and we'll be having um, six presentations throughout the year, so keep your eyes, uh, your ears open and your eyes, op your ears and eyes open. I'm just stumbling over my words here, sorry about that. So today we're going to start off by toasting science, so this is very, very fitting. Um, this presentation falls on the heels of Vancouver Craft Beer Week, so some of you probably participated in that, and that's the reason why we went with this particular talk, because of it seems to be the beer spirit. Um, before I introduce our speaker, just a few bits of housekeeping. Of course, I'd like to thank our, uh, our brewery partners who will be providing the beer for the tasting. So we have Granville Island, Russell Brewing, Central City, and Stanley Park. And you'll get to meet um, some of the people from those different breweries afterwards and talk about their beers. Each of you will, if you've not picked one up at the door, on your way out, you will find at the very first table a survey because we would really like to get your feedback. And maybe a very important thing is that at the bottom of the survey is a ballot for um, a door prize. So you can fill in your name and your contact information and drop that off sometimes before you leave tonight. Um, the other things I just would like to mention is that we will be doing the tasting after the presentation. We'll have time for a little bit of questions uh, here before we go into the tasting room. And then Alec and the brewers will be available for any specific questions you might have. 
To facilitate the tasting, um, everybody should have received an orange wristband. So if you did not receive a wristband, you're either under the age of 19 or for whatever reason you decided you didn't want one. Um, what we're going to do is ask that um, at the end, if you don't have one and you are 19, we'll check your ID, that you please get the wristband so the, the, um, the breweries aren't um, you know, checking your ID so we know ahead of time that you are indeed of, of legal drinking age. Okay, on to the business of the day. Tonight's speaker, Alec Eggie, received his Bachelor of Engineering in Food Processing Technology from Belgrade University and a Master's of Food Science from Dalhousie University in Halifax. Alec perfected the art and science of malting and brewing while working for the Canadian Malting Barley Technical Centre in Winnipeg. After surviving the coldest winter in Manitoba since 1896, Alec decided to move his family out west, and boy, are we glad that he was able to do that. Alec joined KPU in 2014, which was the first intake of our students into our diploma in brewing and brewery operations. And I'm happy to say that our first gradu graduates graduated this uh, about a few weeks ago, and every one of them have got a job in the brewing industry. Many are head, master, head brewmasters, so it's an awesome. Um, Alec has been instrumental in developing curriculum, um, actually helping design the, the brewery that we have that our students use, and he's also the program coordinator for the program. So without uh, any further ado, I'd like Alec to join us, and um, I'll be seeing you after the talk with a few more things. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dean Vorbeck, for a nice introduction. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all, all here tonight. So uh, here we are in a science world uh, talking about beer, right? So typically when you mention beer, science is not the first thing that uh, comes to people's mind. And I'm not really sure why, because it's definitely the first thing that comes to my mind. But um, it's actually true, you know, uh, we, we, you know, when we talk to people and people when, when they phone us, uh, uh, you know, they're kind of surprised that we actually have a program, a two-year diploma program in brewing, because sometimes the reaction is, you need to go to school to learn how to brew? Um, that's, that's a little bit unusual, but that's why we're here, and that's why we you know, like, like to do the presentations like this, where we're actually going to you know, uh, showcase the science of brewing. So um, I'm going to be honest with uh, you here tonight. You know, like, um, I was kind of always good at school. I had good grades in, in high school, you know, in, in sciences stuff, uh, chemistry and, and biology and, and physics and math. But at the same time, I didn't really like school. That was kind of a problem. So, of course, in grade 12, I had to decide, you know, well, what am I going to do for a living? I had to choose my career. Uh, I had to decide or where I'm going to go to university. And uh, I made a long list of things that I didn't want to do. So I didn't want to become a chemist or a microbiologist. I didn't want to do biochemistry or, or, or biology. I had no interest in becoming a, you know, a medical doctor or, or a pharmacist or, or a dentist. I thought about engineering, you know, like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, but none of that really uh, sounded right to me. And then I looked at the agricultural faculty, mostly because it was only five minutes uh, walking distance away from my house. <laughs> of course, I had absolutely no interest in, in agriculture, uh, but they had this program, uh, Food Technology Engineering. So I looked at that, and yeah, there was science, there was engineering, you know, the things that I was good at, but they had a brewing department as part of that program. So, you know, I was 18, and I figure out, well, you know, if I finish this, I'm going to become a brewer, which means that I'll probably get a job in the brewery, which means that I'll be making beer for a living. They're actually going to get pay me to, to make beer. So when you're 18, nothing sounds better. <laughs> I, was, I was so excited. And of course, I joined the program. And now fast forward 30 years, here I am still with the same excitement about everything that has to do anything with, with beer and brewing. So that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. 
uh, I'm going to take you on a journey from barley to beer. And um, I'm actually going to start maybe a little bit unconventional. I'm going to show you a video. Uh, and that, that's the video that I made actually while I was in Winnipeg. And it's called From Barley to Beer in 100 Seconds. So bear with me here for 100 seconds because you're going to see everything that happens on that journey. and every journey begins with the first step. So in that video, we saw the many different steps on that journey from barley to beer. We saw how the barley was cleaned and grated, and then we saw the major steps of the malting process, steeping, germination, kilning. The malt was cleaned and then ground in, and we went to the brew house. You know, we saw how we mashed in, and then there was wort separation and boiling, the hops were added. Uh, you know, we cooled down the wort, injected the oxygen and the yeast, and then the fermentation started. And then, you know, a few weeks later, uh, the beer was almost ready. So all we had to do is go through the filtration, and then the, there was final uh, packaging of beer. But the first step was not part of that video because the first step is is actually an idea. And it's typically idea that uh, you know comes from the or is born in the, in the brewer's mind. And it's an idea about a new product. Now, it can be something as simple as, you know, interpretation of uh, one of the, you know, original beer styles uh, from Europe, or it can have many twists and turns and, uh, you know, a lot of funky things added to it. Uh, so it's, it's about making a recipe uh, for, for a new beer, right? So um, a brewer has to have an idea about the final product. How is the product supposed to look like? So its appearance, its sensory characteristics, how it's supposed to taste like. Um, you have to also come up with uh, a certain uh, specifications about the product, right? So this is how we actually communicate what we're making. Uh, that's part of the, the, the recipe. Uh, we have to decide on the levels of alcohol, the residual sweetness, the original gravity, the final gravity. Uh, the hop bitterness and different hop aromas that we want to uh, see there. Um, what kind of yeast or other microorganisms are we actually going to use in order to, to make that beer? Um, so, you know, specifications are really, really critical there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are some home brewers, even brewers in the crowd. And, uh, you know, sometimes or a lot of the times people are asking us, well, what is the best beer? You know, it's, it's almost impossible to, to answer that question. I think it's, uh, it is impossible. There's actually only one way to answer that question. The best beer is the beer that is consistently meeting its specifications, whatever those specifications are. So if you're uh, a brewer, if you're a, you know, a commercial brewer, that's really critical. Uh, you have to be able to produce uh, that beer 
uh, over and over and over again so that, that those specifications and characteristics are, are not changing. So uh, that's really not that easy to do because uh, if you look at it, we're, we're dealing with, uh, with some raw materials that are constantly changing, right? Uh, so water is extremely important. Uh, then, of course, it's the malting barley or any other grain or cereals that we're going to use in the process. Uh, we're adding hops. So if you think about barley and hops, you know, like every year uh, we have a new crop and every year we have a different environmental condition. So every year we actually, even if we're talking about the same varieties, the raw materials are changing. So we have to adapt our process to those changing conditions of the raw materials in order to produce that final product, the best beer that is consistently meeting its specifications. It's really not that simple. So, and if you look at, uh, you know, like the, the raw materials, so the four basic raw materials in brewing are obviously water, malted barley, hops, and yeast. Uh, just a few months ago, at the end of April, we actually celebrated 500 years of Reitheinsgebot or Bavarian or German beer purity law, which is still in effect, and which says that uh, if you're making beer, those are the four basic raw materials. Of course, yeast was added later because in 1516, people really, or brewers, didn't really know what was responsible for the fermentation process, right? So, you know, we're, we have the raw materials and then we have to factor in all the processing uh, steps and uh, in, in order to, to produce the, the final product. So, after you develop your recipe, you know, you take those raw materials in the brew house and uh, you mix them together and they go through the process and in the brew house is where really the original flavors are born. Uh, so at the end of the day, at the end of the long brewing day, uh, you're actually adding yeast and start uh, the fermentation process. So the yeast is of course changing some of those original flavor, uh, flavors from your wort. Then, of course, there's the aging, where the flavors actually mature, and then the final finishing of the product, where uh, you're actually packaging product and making sure that everything goes right, that everything is clean, that you're not introducing any other microorganisms, that you're not introducing oxygen, because any of those would actually destroy, uh, destroy the flavor uh, of your beer. Um, so we're going to start, uh, of course, with, with malting barley. Uh, that is our first row material, right? Uh, so malting barley is not just any barley. It's, it's a very special barley. It is the highest quality barley. So, uh, I mean, you can make malt from any barley, but you cannot make, uh, you know, high quality commercial malt from any barley. Uh, malting barley actually has to be, the kernels have to be alive uh, because uh, you're actually, during the malting process, you're actually going to start to grow uh, the barley, and then you're going to trick it into doing something different. Um, so I would, we actually have some samples, but uh, obviously I did not bring any samples of, of raw barley because that would be extremely difficult uh, and hard to chew, right? Uh, so what happens during the malting process is, uh, you know, we're modifying the inside of the kernel. Uh, we're breaking down some of the hard components. The other important thing that happens during the malting process is the development of enzymes uh, that are inside, uh, inside barley. The reason that we're actually using barley for malting and for making beer, because it, it, it is a cereal that not only has the husk that we need during the brewing process, but it has the highest enzyme potential. So during the malting process, one of the basic goals is to develop a lot of enzymes, which we're going to actually use during the brewing process. Uh, during, obviously, during the malting process, we are actually, you know, changing a little bit of the uh, of flavor uh, of the original barley. So we're developing some of the interesting and nice flavors, and then we're removing some of the unwanted flavors uh, in the raw material. Uh, so. In general, you know, this is the malting process. This is a schematic of the malting process. Uh, we have three basic steps, which are steeping, germination, and kilning. And you can see steeping over here, germination, and kilning. Of course, this is just the cleaning of barley. Then it needs to be stored at the proper temperature, at the proper uh, moisture level. And then at the, end of the, at the end of the process, we actually have to clean the barley or the malt, remove some of the dry rootlets. And then again, it goes back into the silo and it's stored. Uh, uh, there until it's, it's shipped to a brewery. 
Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the malting process. I actually uh, received a couple of emails where people asked me to maybe spend a little bit more time talking about the malting process because apparently a lot of people know how to brew, but not so many know how to malt. So, uh, so th as I said, you know, the basic three steps of the malting process are steeping, germination, and kilning. So everything starts, starts with steeping. That, that is the first stage. So what we're trying to do during the malting process, we're actually going to start to grow the barley. If you put barley in the ground and if the moisture level inside the kernel uh, reaches about 30%, that barley is actually going to grow into a new barley plant. Of course, our goal is very different from that. Uh, ultimately, we want to make beer. So we're tricking barley into doing something different, uh, you know, producing malt. Uh, so during the steeping process, we're actually mixing barley. We're putting it into big tanks and we're adding water. Um, at about 15 degrees Celsius. You know, if you, if you want to malt, you kind of have to create spring-like conditions, you know, uh, spring-like temperatures and definitely lots of moisture. So we're starting with the raw material that has only about 12% of moisture. We're putting it in water and we're increasing that, uh, you know, moisture percentage to around 30%. And then after that, we actually have to drain the water because if you just keep the barley in that water, you would actually kill the germ. Uh, it would drown in there. So we have to give it a little bit of break. So typically, steeping process has two or three wet cycles, but in between those wet cycles, we actually have dry cycles. So we are draining the water, and then the barley just sits in a vessel where we're actually removing some of the, um, some of the gases from inside from the bottom. Uh, the barley starts to breathe, it develops carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is heavier than the air, so it goes down. So most of these steep tanks are actually cylindrical conical vessels, so there's a fan at the bottom where we're actually sucking the CO2 out so that the new air can come in and that the barley can breathe. So, you know, after the, that, that dry cycle, uh, we put more water into the steep tank. The moisture goes up to about 40% with dry water again. And then our goal is to put about 45% of moisture into the kernel because that would allow us uh, to modify the inside of the kernel during the germination process. So we need about 45% of moisture. After that, we transfer that barley with lots of moisture uh, into a germination vessel. And germination is typically about uh, four days long. So what we're doing right now is we're maintaining the moisture level inside the kernel because we need that moisture and the barley starts to grow. But this is where we're actually manipulating that grow because we really don't want barley to develop a lot of rootlets and to, you know, develop a big acrospire. It starts to grow into a new plant. What we want is to modify the inside of the kernel. So we want to break down a lot of the cell wall material of the beta-glucans and arabinosilans. We want to break down the protein matrix inside the cell. And then finally, we want to reach the starch granules because starch molecules are packed within the starch granules. And this is our extract. Because during the brewing process, we're going to use those enzymes that we have developed during the mal malting process and then break down starch into small sugars. Because the yeast, as a microorganisms, can only metabolize small sugars, one, two, three sugar molecules, okay? So that, that is really critical. So during the malting process, we are also, uh, you know, we're, we're doing all sorts of different measurements, but we're also relying on our senses. So the malster would go in and take sample every day and look at the acrospire and look at how long it is. One of the most important things during the malting process is the uniform modification, right? We want all those kernels to grow at the same rate. <coughs> and there's a lot of tasting and, and, and smelling. So after four days of germination, if you go into, into a, a big germination room, it kind of smells like cucumber, like fresh cucumber. If, if, if that's what you smell inside the germination chamber, you're good, you're making good malt. Uh, that's, a, that's a good sign. So after all that, so we've modified the inside. Uh, the barley is not hard, it's actually very friable. We have now some sugars there. We've modified about 10% of the starch into, into sugar. And uh, now we have to dry the kernel. Uh, so we are now blowing some hot or warm to start with and then hot air through the, uh, through the kiln in order to remove the moisture. But we have to do it carefully because if we increase the temperature too much, while well, there's still a lot of moisture inside the kernels, we would damage the, the enzymes. We would actually destroy the enzymes. And it's really critical that we have those enzymes because 
uh, the brewer needs enzymes during the brewing process, you know. Because if you talk to the brewers, and I'm kind of both a maltzer and a brewer, um, if you talk to the brewers, if anything goes wrong, they just say, well, you just blame the maltster if something was wrong in the brewing process. So I guess for myself it means, well, I can only blame myself. If there's something wrong during brewing, I made a bad malt, right? Um, so uh, I've been mostly talking about, you know, the base malt. And this is the malt that we use to make sort of any kind of beer. Uh, but we can also make uh, many different types of specialty malts, right? So uh, there's so many different beer styles on the market and they have different flavors and colors and aroma. And then most of that, or a lot of it, comes from, from different mal malt samples. So during the final stages of malting process, during the killing, we can actually increase the temperature and then we can produce a lot of color and, and, and flavor and aroma in, in the malt. So we have many, many different types of specialty malt. And if you look here, you know, these are all the different colors that we can create in beer just by using different malt samples. And uh, of course, we're using some units to, to describe what the color uh, of, of the malt is. But uh, this is just sort of to give you uh, an example of, of the range of different specialty malts that we can produce simply by increasing the temperature in the final stages of, of killing process. So to make a pale malt, we, are, we would typically go to temperatures around 80 degrees Celsius. But if we want to produce something like chocolate malt, the temperatures would be over 200 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we said that we we're going, uh, going to talk about the sensory. So there's, uh, I, I brought three malt samples, which you know, after the presentation, you can actually go and, and if you want, you can taste those samples. So we have a sample of, of a base malt or, or a pale malt. So it's a typical two-row malt. And uh, you know, uh, the flavor intensity is relatively low. But if you look at some of the flavors that are present there, you, know, you can definitely detect some of the sweetness, some of the sort of bready character, biscuity character in, in, a, in a base malt or, or a pale malt. Then there's also a sample of, uh, of um, caramel malt. So that is produced at, at higher temperature. We're actually stewing that inside. We sometimes we actually modify a lot of the sugars during the, uh, the malting process in order to produce uh, some of the flavors and aromas and, and colors that are present in the caramel malt, you know. So it's more like candy flavors, like toasty, honey, nutty, and caramel. Uh, so again, if you want, uh, you th there's a sample of malt, you can take a few kernels and, and, and taste that. And then finally, there's a sample of chocolate malt. Um, so as I said, you know, that uh, you, you can actually get chocolate malt if you go to really, really high temperatures, or like 230 degrees Celsius. So you get a lot of the you know, uh, the burnt uh, flavor and then sort of roasted and maybe sometimes smoky character in that malt. Uh, so by using, you know, different kinds of malt in different proportions and, and during the brewing process, we can definitely develop a lot of different colors and flavors and aroma in our final product. So, you know, now that, now that we've mentioned, you know, barley and malt, uh, we're going to go into the brew house, and this is really where the, the, the brewing proce process starts. So we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, different water that we're going to use, different grains. I mean, most of the time we're using uh, malting barley, but we can also use uh, malted wheat, or we can also use different adjuncts which did, which did not go through the malting process. Um, and then, uh, obviously, you know, uh, different hops and, and definitely different yeast. But it also, everything depends uh, on, on the type of the brewery that we have and, and different processing steps uh, uh, that we can actually use in the brewery in order to produce the final product. So water, obviously, uh, you know, that I would say that this is the first raw material when, when you talk about uh, beer, right? I mean, if you think about it, you know, more than 90% of the beer is water. So water is really, really important, and it's, 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 it's critical. It's, it's critical that we have good brewing water. So at the very minimum, you know, the water is supposed to be colorless and odorless and, uh, well, almost tasteless. It's not supposed to have any microorganisms, obviously, because we do not want our yeast to compete against any other microorganisms. We want to have a control fermentation. But it's what's really important is also the mineral composition uh, of that water. And if you think about many of the, you know, traditional brewing styles, th the styles that they, they developed in, in, in regions uh, in, in Europe which had really specific uh, water, you know, the mineral composition of that water was very different in different cities. So I'm going to mention four of them, 
you know, uh, for example, Burton and Trent in England is famous for, for a pale ale. Then if you go to Ireland, to Dublin, uh, obviously, you know, Irish stouts are coming from there. And then you go to kind of Central Europe, Germany, uh, in Bavaria, Munich, right? So you have dark lagers coming from there, and that are not very far. Actually, in Czech Republic, uh, you go to Pilsen, and that's where, of course, the, the Pilsners are coming from. So water composition is very, very different uh, in, the, in these different places, right? So this is the, the Marston's Brewery in, on Burton on Trent, right? So if you, if you kind of looked at the, the composition of that water, it has um, a lot of gypsum in it, right? So um, calcium sulfate. It's really, really rich in calcium sulfate. It also has calcium carbonate, which is kind of bringing the pH down. So, um, you know, again, if there's any home brewers, you've probably heard about Burtonization in brewing, and it's adjusting your calcium sulfate composition to kind of mimic what, what's in, in Burton water. And, and what it does, it actually brings out some of the interesting flavors and aromas that are present in the malt. And because of the sulfur there, uh, you know, the yeast is using sulfur, of course, during its metabolism, and it's producing uh, hydrogen sulfate. And uh, actually, there's, uh, there's a quite a bit of it there. So, you know, hydrogen sulfate, that's actually a rotten egg aroma, <laughs> right? So, um, yes, rotten egg aroma is something that, you know, when we're tasting British pale ales, is supposed to be there at a certain level. And with all the other flavors that are present, you know, uh, I'm always looking for it, right? So that kind of sounds weird. Uh, you like rotten eggs? No, no, no. I just like a little bit of that rotten egg aroma in, in a real British pale ale, okay? It's supposed to be there. Um, so, of course, Guinness, uh, uh, we're in Dublin or in Ireland, you know, uh, obviously stout. So, again, very uh, specific uh, mineral composition of that water. So now we don't have calcium sulfate, but there's lots of calcium chloride there. Again, there's... Uh, calcium carbonate, um, so, you know, a lot of dark mal, actually roasted barley, works well with that water composition. Uh, if you go to Germany, to Munich, uh, they're famous for their dark lagers. It's also hard water. Uh, they actually have a lot of calcium carbonate there. And what calcium carbonate does is kind of, uh, you know, increases the pH uh, of the brewing water. And we actually want the pH to be a little bit lower and we want it in, in just in the right range. And if you're using uh, darker malts, that actually brings the pH down. So that's the reason why, you know, dark lagers are were so good in Germany. That's the reason why they were actually using. Um, I would think that probably it was mostly trial and error. Uh, but uh, because I don't think originally they exactly realized what's what was happening there. But... Uh, yeah, dark lagers are, are famous from, from Munich. And then finally, if you go to Pilsen, uh, or Pilsner in Czech Republic, of course, uh, this is the birthplace of uh, the most famous style in the world, the Pilsen beer, right? Very, very soft water. Uh, so that's the reason why you can use very pale malt, the palest malt, white malts, uh, in order to produce the Czech Pilsner beer. Uh, Okay, so we have water, we have malt, and now we can start mashing. Mashing is really the first step in the brewing process. So after you grind your malt, you mix it with water, and you go into your mash tun, and this is where, where mm, some of the original flavors are actually born. So what we're doing during mashing process, now we're putting those enzymes uh, to work. We want the enzymes to break some of those non-starch polysaccharides. We want them to break some of the proteins. But most importantly, we want the enzymes to break starch. Because the basic building blocks of, of a starch molecules are, are small sugars. So as I've mentioned, you know, the yeast can only uh, utilize sugars uh, that are very small. So one, two, or three molecules of sugar. So uh, there's a lot of different things that we can do in the mash, uh, mash tun. You know, we have two traditional styles, uh, styles of mashing, the infusion mashing, single temperature, around 65 degrees Celsius, which is typical for, uh, for England, and then there's the decoction mashing, which is typical for Germany and Central Europe, where you actually move the malt back and forth between, uh, or the mash between two different vessels, and you're, you're hitting specific temperatures, you know, temperatures that are good for non-starch polysaccharide, uh, or the enzymes that are breaking them, the enzymes that are breaking, uh, you know, proteins, because again, you know, like the same way that we need protein in our diet, it's important for the yeast, except the proteins are too big for, uh, big for the yeast, so they're using, again, basic building blocks, which are the amino acids. 
So we are hitting specific temperatures, target temperatures, in order to produce the wort, uh, which is going to practically to become food for the yeast. Um, in the next stage, we are now, so we now have liquid, which is full of grain and lots of husk. Of course, the barley has the husk on the outside, and that's really important for our, uh, us brewers because that husk material is actually going to form a filter bed in the next stage in, in the ward separation or in the lottering vessel. So uh, I actually have two pictures here. So this is a typical lotter ton, but you can also do ward separation in, in a mash filter. And uh, I mean, lotter tons are... Uh, there are more, way more lotter tons, but there are some breweries that are using mash filter, which is sort of a newer technology. You can get more, more extract there. So now the, the goal is to separate all that husk material and everything. So we're filtering the, 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 the sweet wort, which is now full of sugars, through, uh, through that husk material, and it becomes less and less hazy. Right? So after that, we're sending wort to the next... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and actually... Uh, I also brought a sample. I have two uh, process samples that uh, I brought from the from our brewery uh, because we were brewing this morning. And the first one is sweet wort. So this is now the wort that we're collecting in our kettle, uh, which is full of sugars. So I have uh, two growlers uh, of those samples. So if any of you are interested, you can actually take the in process, taste the in process sample. So this sample has a lot of sugar in it, right? So it's 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 very very rich in sugar. Uh, and you can notice some of the, the flavor characteristics of that product. So what we were doing today, we were, uh, you know, brewing a sort of a specific type of a pale ale. So we were using the base malt and we were using the chocolate malt. So some of the flavors that I've mentioned that are present in those two raw materials, you can also notice in the wort sample, in the sweet wort sample. So now that we have that sweet wort sample, it's, it, it goes into the kettle and uh, we start to boil. Uh, and there are many different things that, that we're doing during boiling. Uh, the one of the basic reasons is that uh, we're boiling in order to kind of sterilize the wort because, again, we don't want to have any other microorganisms there uh, except for the ones that we are going to use during the fermentation process. We're also coagulating some of the, some of the protein material that is there. Uh, so, um, and then, then we're adding hops, right? So uh, the hops are added at this stage and... Uh, the hops will give you the bitterness and the aroma. So uh, this, is, this is a picture of a hop comb, and you can see some of this yellow material, which are lupulin glands, which are full of uh, hop aroma and hop bitterness. So basically, we're using two different types of hops. At the beginning of the boiling process, uh, we're adding bittering hops uh, because you know, we want some of that good bitterness. Uh, we want it out, we want to e extract it, and it actually changes a little bit during the brewing process. And then towards the end of the brewing process, we're adding the, or boiling, we're adding the aroma hops there. Uh, so the hops are actually, you know, perennial plants. They grow up to 25 feet. Uh, these pictures were taken three or four years ago in Yakima Valley, which is the largest growing region, hops growing region in, in North America, right? So, I mean, you can see how tall these things are. These are actually about 18 or 19 feet tall. Uh, these pictures were taken almost 100 years ago, and this is from, from Europe. So, obviously, a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of work during the harvest. Now it's all mechanized, but you can also see over here that it required some very, very special skills, you know, at that time if you were a, if you were a hop grower, right? So... Um, so let's, let's talk about hop bitterness, right? So this is one of the obviously basic flavors that we can taste. And the reason that we're adding hops to the, to the wort is that I have already mentioned wort is sweet and now we need a little bit of bitterness to balance all that sweetness. Uh, we are measuring that bitterness uh, and you can see that, you know, a lot of the craft brewers are actually putting IBUs units on, on the label. So if you see IBU, that stands for International Bitterness Units, right? So uh, the higher the IBU, the more bitter the beer is. Of course, that's, we, we, we're measuring that in the lab. We're doing a chemical analysis, or we can actually calculate how much the IBUs are going to be. But for, for you know, a regular beer drink or a taster, you know, we're you know, mostly talking about low, moderate, or, or high bitterness. We're not really talking about IBUs. But so... 
Bitterness, obviously, uh, is also going to change the mouthfeel of the beer. So, you know, it will change your, you know, it will have some palate cleansing, you know, add a little bit of biting, it will have a drying effect. Uh, but it also improves uh, things like foam stability and, and general stability of the beer, you know. Um, hops are actually antimicrobial, so gram-positive bacteria cannot grow in the presence of hops. So, you know, um, that's the reason why IBAs uh, or uh, India Pale Ales are so bitter, because when British had their troops in India, the, the beer would spoil on its way, but then they figure out if they make a beer a little bit stronger, you know, higher alcohol, and if they added more hops, you know, the beer would not spoil. This is all because of the, you know, antimicrobial properties of the hops. Um, so, and what I have here is, you know, a, a list of different beer styles, and you can see how these bitterness units are, are going up, you know, starting from American light lager, which has, you know, only four to seven, IBUs all the way up to, you know, Imperial IPAs or India Pale Ales, which are way over 65 IBUs. And just to put things in perspective, you know, if we're talking about the flavor threshold of bitterness, you know, for most of us it's about 10 IBUs. Um, so, you know, some people cannot even taste any bitterness, which is at, at these levels, right? So, uh, you know, and we can define flavor threshold in many different ways, but, you know, generally we can say, well, the flavor threshold is if 50% of us can detect that per uh, particular flavor 50% of the time, right? So if we were to do this in this room, you know, we can actually determine exactly where our flavor threshold for bitterness would be, right? Um, and then, uh, as I said, you know, we're using hops also because of their aroma. They have very, uh, you know, many, many different aromas. So soon after the harvest, the brewers would actually go and they would select hops that they wanted to use in, the, in, in their beer. So the, uh, the hops, are, you know, obviously they're dry. They also go through the killing process, so the moisture level is, is reduced, and then they're vacuum-packed. And what these guys are doing, you know, they're, they're taking hop leaves, leaves and rubbing between the, oops, the palms of, of uh, their, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and if you do that, you know, and, and you smell it, um, well, you're looking for some specific aromas that are present there, but you're also looking for some, uh, well, off flavors and things that are not supposed to be there, uh, which I would say is even more critical than, than finding things that are supposed to be there, uh, because you definitely don't want your beer to smell uh, cheesy and sweaty, uh, and which can happen if, if the hops is oxidized, right? So. Um, hop aroma, right? So a lot, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a raw material that changes every year. And not only that it changes every year, but if you look at one hop variety and if you grow it in a single year, uh, year at, at three different, uh, you know, places, it's, it's going to be different. It, it's, it's going to change. It. But if we're, if we're talking, you know, in general, we have some, you know, major characteristics of different hop varieties depending on where, where they come from. So, you know, North American hops, for example, are very citrusy, you know, so things like lemon and orange and grapefruit are, are typical, some of the characteristics that we're using to describe those aromas that are present there, or, or estery, you know, fruity. Then if you go to uh, sort of uh, Central Europe, and if you look at European varieties, you know, they're more floral and spicy, and then the UK, you know, more like pine or wood and earthy. And then of course we have the New World varieties, you know, like from Australia and New Zealand, which have a lot of tropical, you know, passion fruit. So very, very general. Um, I've also brought a sample of hops, which we have actually used today uh, when we were brewing our beer, and it's the citra hops. So, uh, those are hop palettes, but you can do the same thing. You can take one or two palettes. Don't really try to taste them. They don't taste really great, but you can rub, it, rub them between your hands and then, then smell it. And you'll see, of course, if you name your hop citra, it's probably going to be citrusy, right? So that's what's, what's going to be there. Yeah, a true hop head. <laughs> um, so we also have a sample of that same word, which was first sweet at the beginning of the boiling process, but then after we've added hops and after we boiled for about an hour and a half, 
the sweetness is still there. It's actually more sweet because typically in about an hour and a half of boiling, we evaporate 10% of the water. So there's more sugar there, but it's not as noticeable because we've added hops and hops is bitter. So this uh, hopped wort would actually taste both sweet, uh, sweet and bitter, but bitterness is probably the first thing that you're going to notice there. Uh, so again, we have one growler of that, so if you're, you're welcome to try some of that. Um, and then finally, you know, after we go through the brewing process, uh, we're, we're, you know, obviously adjusting the temperature of the wort because we're going to add yeast, which is a microorganism. Uh, so typically, you know, we can use a lager yeast or an ale yeast. They both work a little bit different. One metabolizes at higher temperature, that would be an ale. The lager is fermenting at a little bit lower temperature. Um, the main product of the fermentation, obviously, is alcohol or ethanol and also carbon dioxide. Um, so the yeast, of course, is, is a living uh, microorganism. So we actually have to take great care. Uh, the happy yeast makes a happy brewer or the other way around. Uh, it's... Uh, it's important that we, you know, same as in the malting process, we're manipulating the growth of, uh, of the barley, but during the, the fermentation, we're kind of manipulating the growth of the yeast. And we want our yeast to go through its metabolism and to produce some of the flavors uh, that we're looking for in that beer. Uh, so we have many, many different, uh, you, know, uh, you know, strains of different yeast, both ales and lagers. And uh, as I said, you know, the main products of the fermentation is alcohol, which is ethanol and, and carbon dioxide. But the yeast is also producing a lot of different, uh, you know, very flavorful uh, aromas, estery aromas. Uh, and those are all present in different beers. Um, you know, even if we change temperature slightly, if we go to, let's say, from 17 to 20 degrees Celsius, you're going to produce beer, which is going to have different aromas, which, which are present there. Um, also, one thing that I forgot to mention is that, you know, even though, uh, you know, typically we have 5%, you know, let's say in general, 5% of alcohol, there's way more alcohol than any of these other flavor uh, compounds there. But alcohol or ethanol is actually uh, not very flavorful. I don't want to say completely flavorless, but the flavor threshold is about 14,000 ppbs, right? So, uh, alcohol does uh, have sort of a warming effect. So, if you're drinking beer that has... 5% or more uh, ethanol or alcohol, you're actually going to get that warm, warm feeling when, while, while you're drinking. Uh, also, there's carbonation. That's the other major product of, uh, or byproduct of uh, um, fermentation process. So, um, beer, of course, is a naturally carbonated beverage. You know, what we're doing is uh, we can actually, towards the end of fermentation, we can completely close the fermenter vessel. It's a pressurized vessel, so we can actually capture all the CO2 and have, you know, naturally carbonated beer. It's a, it's a very common practice, uh, practice in Europe. You can either have bunging devices or you can, again, you know, this is what I love about brewing is, you know, you have to do a lot of calculation. If you do your calculation right, you're going to get just the right amount of CO2 naturally carbonated. You can also do things like croisoning, so you actually bring some of the wort which is in high fermentation into your beer which is done fermenting, so you can also carbonate like that. Um, you know, bottle conditioning, cask conditioning, where we're adding uh, actually a little bit of sugar to the beer that hasn't been filtered, so there's still yeast there, so again, natural carbonation. Or we can even use, you know, things like nitrogen, which is, of course, not naturally produced by the yeast, but, you know, if you've ever had a can of uh, Guinness, there's something, when, you, when you're done, there's something clicking inside. That's the widget. It's, it's actually nitrogen under pressure. So as soon as you open your can, uh, there are micropores there, and nitrogen goes out and it produces those tiny, tiny bubbles. You know, so the, the foam in Guinness almost looks like cream because nitrogen is not very soluble, and it makes those small bubbles, which are the identical size, and it makes that everlasting foam. And then finally, you know, the, in the final stages of the process, uh, of course, we have the packaging, so that's also really important. As I said, you know, we it, it's critical that uh, you know we don't have any microorganisms that are 
going into our beer at, at the end of fermentation, uh, and that we're not introducing any oxygen because the oxygen is the enemy of beer. The last stage where we want to see oxygen is actually before the, fer the fermentation process where we're injecting some of the oxygen because the yeast needs a lot of oxygen at the beginning of the fermentation process but for propagation, but then it switches to uh, anaerobic metabolism, right? So uh, if you ever taste beer that tastes like cardboard or papery, uh, that's, that's a serious defect and that's because it's oxidized. So, you know, bring it back. That's not good. Uh, I mean... It's not going to make you sick, but it just doesn't taste very well. Okay, so, uh, you know, we, we talked about a lot of these different things, so, you know, different raw materials, and, uh, you know, the final quality of the beer uh, is really what we're concerned with, so we have to take a lot of care during the entire process, right? But it's all about the passion of, of the brew my, uh, meister or brewmaster that... Uh, you know, uh, great care needs to be taken throughout the process, you know, like uh, the difference between a good beer and a great beer is in little details. So you kind of have to make sure that you do everything right, that you have every step of the process that you're doing exactly what it's, as it's supposed to be done. So and then finally, of course, we have the final product, right? So uh, now we're supposed to taste beer. Uh, <laughs> so what are the flavors in beer? It's not easy to describe that, and as Charlie Bamford from UC Davis said, well, nobody said it was easy, right? Uh, we're actually all, well, most of us are good tasters, but it's sometimes not easy to describe what we're tasting, you know? So part of it, part of it is, is learning the vocabulary, right? Learning to describe what we can actually taste. Um, so, you know, for people like me and, and brewers, you know, it makes a lot of sense to talk about different beer styles and ales and lagers and wheat beers and all the different flavors that are present there. But, you know, for, for an, an average consumer, you know, it can sometimes get confusing. You know, if you look at the Beer Judge Certificate pro, uh, program, we have now over a different, you know, over a hundred different beer styles. And uh, um, it's maybe easier and maybe it makes more sense to look at some of the major flavors or flavor groups that are present in different beers. And we can kind of divide them in, in four different groups. So we can have beers that are very malt driven because most of the flavor is coming from the malt. Then we can have beers with, that are very hop driven. So those would be your IPAs, for example, a lot of hops, you know, both bitterness and hoppy aroma. Uh, then fermentation driven, you know, where most of the flavors is actually developed by the yeast during the fermentation or flavor driven, you know, where we're actually adding different flavors, uh, you know, which can come from either aging in wood or adding chocolate or coffee or different fruits, for example. So again, you know, like malt, uh, you know, flavor driven beers, you know, can be rich in pale malt when you talked about you know, what kind of flavors are present in the pale malt and the caramel and in the dark malt. But, you know, I guess the most important thing is to realize that these flavors are relatively low impact and, you know, caramel malt is kind of moderate impact while the chocolate is, is more high impact flavors. And I talked about, uh, you know, hops. So we're looking really here for different levels of bitterness and all the different aromas that are present there. So this is more of a dri uh, sort of a traditional way of looking at hops as either bitterness on, or aroma hops. Nowadays, we more talk about the flavor in different hops. And then the fermentation, right? As I said, we can use ales, we can use lagers, we can use, uh, you know, kind of uh, yeast that uh, are producing, you know, like uh, wheat beers and then other microorganisms, you know, like Brettanomyces and bacteria. And, uh, uh, many, many different flavors are coming really from the microorganisms, from their metabolism. And then finally, as I said, you know, flavor beer. So we're adding something uh, towards the end of the process that would actually uh, be the, the, you know, major flavor impact on the, on the final product. Uh, it's also important to, you know, uh, well, the, if, if you take anything, uh, you know, after today's presentation is that don't drink beer from a bottle or a can. Okay, always find a nice glass, pour it in the glass, and then we have the four S's, or, or five, right? Uh, C, look at, look at what you have in your glass, you know, notice things about, you know, like the color and the foam and the, and the, 
carbonation level or is it hazy is it uh, has it been filtered and then you know kind of cover the glass swirl it around let some of that co2 go out because that will actually carry some of those wonderful aromas that are pl present there so after that you actually want to sniff that so you see if you put it in the glass your nose is inside if it's in the bottle you're not getting any of that <laughs> right so uh, definitely always find at least some sort of a cup and then, of course, sip the beer, and then the, we save the last, <laughs> of course, swallowing, right? We actually have, when we're tasting beer, we actually have to swallow the samples. We're not really using, we're not big on, you know, s spitting cups. No, not in brewing. The reason for that is that, of course, beer is bitter. That's one of the major flavor characteristics. Or, uh, and, and most of the, our taste buds that are detecting bitterness are at the very root of our thang. So we actually do swallow when we're tasting, right? So um, just a few words about the beer flavor wheel. As I said, you know, like when you're tasting, really the most important thing is to develop this lexicon of flavor, right? So we're, we're actually able to detect many different things, but we are not able to describe that. So in, in the brewing industry, we're using beer flavor wheel where we have, you know, like uh, things like class terms and first tier terms and second tier terms. So this is the beer flavor wheel. And you see there's lots going on there. But, you know, like we have uh, these class terms over here and then the first and the second tier. And if you look over here, there's over 100 different flavors and aromas which are present on that, on that flavor wheel. And this is what we're trying when we're describing what we're tasting. We're, we don't really even say, well, uh, it's fruity. We want to be able to describe, well, what kind of fruit is this? Like, is it banana? Is it green apple? Is it ripe apple? Is it, you know, peachy? Um, so um, this is simply describing, right, what, what we have on that beer, beer flavor wheel. And uh, right now, uh, we're actually, because of the, you know, many, many different beer styles, we're looking at uh, maybe moving away from a beer flavor wheel and developing something like, more like a flavor tree, for example. Um, but the basic, basic groups are here, and there's some overlap. You see uh, the aroma and the taste. You have sour and acidic and sweet on both sides, on, on the aroma and, and the taste. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff I moved, uh, uh, that I moved here is uh, from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, from their uh, Beer Steward Handbook, and uh, the Beer Flavor Wheel is from the ASBC, American Society of, of Brewing Chemists. Uh, these are the beers that you're actually going to taste today, and uh, those are the four, four samples that uh, fall uh, into those four different categories that I've mentioned. So, you know, this would be a representative of the, fla uh, of the uh, fermentation driven, uh, flavor driven, malt driven, and, and hop driven. Okay. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, um, I know we're all anxious to do some beer tasting, but I thought if there were any questions, burning questions that you would like to ask Alec right now, otherwise he will be out into in the lobby where the beer tasting is, and you can certainly come up and talk to him, as well as the brewers that are here, um, and they'll be manning the different tables, so please, please ask questions. But are there any general questions? Right here, this gentleman here. So the question is, what is the difference between dry hops and wet hops? Well, the, the, the dry hopping is the, is the practice that brewers are using more and more these days. And, uh, you know, we're typically, uh, as I said, you know, we're adding hops during the boiling process. So we're adding bitterness hops at the beginning of the boiling process, the aroma hops uh, towards the end of the boiling process. But then we can also dry hop the beer. And that's typically done, you know, like, for example, in a fermentation vessel where you actually take uh, either the hop pallets or hop leaves and uh, you put them inside a fermenter, typically in, in a bag, so that they can actually, you know, they're, they're kind of cold extract at some of the aroma. So that's not going to actually change uh, the bitterness of the beer at all, but it's going to bring out more of the aromas which are present in the hops. Okay, another question? Okay, one more in the middle. Oh, it, we'll yell it out. <laughs> So the question is, is it true that um, 
people from the, U I guess, North America prefer less carbonated beer than uh, European friends. Okay, well, uh, you know, some, some people from, for, from Europe or, or some countries, it really depends on the beer style and in general, right? So if you're talking about wheat beer and lager beer, those are very, very carbonated, I would say, both here and in Europe. But, uh, you know, if you go to England, you know, m traditional ales fermented in open fermentation vessels, you know, most of the CO2 escapes, and so it's not very, very carbonated. So I would say that, you know, like, uh, in, in North America, you know, a lot of the breweries are actually brewing some of the traditional styles that are coming from Europe, and uh, they want to, you know, stay within those style guidelines. Um, but some North Americans are actually drinking beer, which is way more carbonated than it's supposed to be if they drink it from the bottle, right? If you pour it into a can, some of the CO2 goes out. So again, you know, don't drink it, don't drink it from the bottle. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I just would like to put in a, a plug for our program. So we have a two-year diploma in brewing and brewery operations. Alec is one of our instructors, and he does teach the sensory courses along with other ones. So um, there's information on that, and please uh, you know, make sure that you pick that up. And be prepared for our next lecture. So the second one in the series will be in August. And it's the inspiration of bees. And we have actually three speakers that will be presenting in that one. And actually right here in our audience, okay, I can't see. You can raise your hand. Jim Mattioni is our entomologist who be from our uh, School of Horticulture. We'll have Stephanie Phillips from our School of Design and Laventi Orban from our psychology department. So it's going to be a very interesting talk about many different aspects of bees. So without uh, you know, getting into bees, because we're all excited about that, I'd like to again thank Alec and thank you, and please make your way out there uh, to get your uh, beer samples, and please fill in the survey. So thank you very much, and thank you, Alec. <laughs>